Welcome to Nanog's Internet Innovators, a series that allows you to learn more about some of the brightest and boldest tech minds of our time. Join us as we look to the past, present, and future of the internet and talk to the innovators who are actually there. Every month, we will be interviewing internet innovators who revolutionize the internet as we know it. Watch as we host conversations with those that are building the internet of tomorrow. Welcome, Leonard Kleinrock. How are you? Pleasure to be here. Oh, pleasure to have you. You're joining us from LA? Yes, I am. Well, Leonard, let's start out with, ta- tell me about this room that you are virtually in. Yes, this is where the internet began. This is an engineering building, Belter Hall, the UCLA. That machine that I'm pointing to right now, that is the first router ever on the internet. We called it a packet switch at that time. The routers these days are the size of your cell phone, if you will. That is the size of a telephone booth or a refrigerator. It's a, it's a basically hardened machine. You can whack it and it's meant to sustain force. It's meant to sit in the corner of the room. It's from that machine that we sent the first message. This room itself is where it served. It was in those four square feet you see it sitting at right now, plugged into the wall behind it. So this is basically, if you wanna know where a revolution began, can you tell me where the industrial revolution began or where the agricultural revolution began? You probably can't tell me the minute and the four square feet where they happen, but you can with this. It's those four square feet on October 29th, 1969 at 10.30 at night when the first message was sent. And over here, this machine right here is the original host computer, the time shared computer that connected to that machine in the back in the, in the original room. It's called a scientific data system, Sigma 7. It was the first big machine on the internet ever. Uh, Behind me, if I move aside, you see that teletype there, right over there. (laughs) That was connected to the host computer. Uh, There are some pictures in the room showing what it looked like then. And by the way, the color of the room and those fluorescent lights. Yes, I was going to ask who this interior decorator was. (laughs) Well, it was way back in, that's the color of 69. You just walked back 50 years. Into Am I glad to have missed that era? <laughs> look, look, look at the, uh, the magnetic tape over here, the tape roll. Yeah. Some of these documents here, these are journals from the period 1969 in which I was able to publish some of the results of the early ARPANET. Oh, wow. Um, that book here, let's see if I can point to it. Uh, this, is that, this is the most important document of the internet ever. It is the log book in which the record is made of the first message ever on the internet. Amazing. It, it, and it's a- Do you miss that room? Do I miss it? I, I go a lot of the time. feelings of nostalgia there? Yes, it is. And I, I, I spend time there, I give tours there. It's down the hall from my office. The entire computer science department moved to a brand new building about 600 feet away. I didn't move for two reasons. One, I wanted to be near this room and near the connection lab. And also because I had books. And the new offices aren't large enough for all the books I have. So I'm in the old building with my old buddy, this room. This is the internet history room where it all began. You were born in 1934 in Harlem, New York City. So tell me, what kind of kid were you? So I grew up in the streets of New York, uh, learning how to take care of myself, but enjoying all the, the pleasures of youth. Uh, What was it like in Harlem back in that day? Did you have to grow up tough? Or I'm sure the Harlem we know as today is a lot different, but how was it back then? Well, it was tough. It wasn't, my hospital I was born in was in Harlem, but I live in Washington Heights, which was again, not a very safe neighborhood, but it wasn't as tough as Harlem. And, you know, you'd see people get killed on the street. Oh, wow. They'd whack you with with rocks and, 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 and sticks a couple of zip guns around, but mostly it was sports and, you know, playing stickball, punch ball, ring a But it was, it was, it was a, 
it's a kind of place where you learn what's real. There's no pretense. You know, the typical thing is when you walk down the street in New York, somebody says to you, get out of here. You know, it's don't give me that nonsense. So there's 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 no uh, puffery. It's it's all it is what it is. It is what it is. And how do you think that uh, that background shaped the man that you are today? Well, it made me realize that I had to make my own way. There would be no gifts along the way. And I had to look at the reality of a situation and not pretend things were better or worse than they really were. And that applied not only to my to my social life, but also to my research. You know, you look for problems that are important and real, and you don't want to fool yourself and to think you've done something great if you've not, or try to cover up a mistake. You never want to do that. And so the reality, the realism, I think carry through in my in my social life and in my professional life. I read that you built a crystal radio from a description in a Superman comic. Tell me more about this. So I had just entered elementary school and I loved comic books. And I was reading a Superman comic. And one day I opened it up and in the centerfold, it was not comics, but it was a description of something. As you said, it was a description how to make something called a crystal radio. And they said you could build it out of parts you could find around the house and it wouldn't need any power, no batteries, no electricity, and you could hear music. I said, wow, this is exciting, let's try it. So I looked around the house and the first thing I needed was an empty toilet paper roll. Well, I could find that. Second thing I needed was some wire. So I went out in the street and I found some wire in the gutter. And then I needed a crystal. And they said you could make a crystal out of your father's old razor blade and a piece of pencil lead. So I was just fine. Then it said, I needed an earphone. Well, where do you get an earphone? Well, I knew that in the candy store down the street, there was a telephone booth, which had a telephone with an earpiece. And I knew if you unscrewed the earpiece, you could pull out, take it away and use it yourself. So I stole the damn thing. <laughs> now, the last thing I needed was a little more complicated, was something called a variable capacitor. And I knew the only place I could get that would be downtown New York, on Canal Street, where all the surplus electronics from World War II was being sold. So my mother took me down in the subway. We walked up to the first electronics store. I walked up to the counter, and I banged my fist on the table and said, I need a variable capacitor. And the guy said, what size? And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> it blew my cover. I had no idea. But I told him why I wanted it. He knew exactly what I needed, sold it to us for a nickel, went home, wired it up, and I could hear music. I could change stations. No batteries, I said, no, no electricity. And I was hooked. This was magic. And to be honest with you, I've been spending the rest of my life trying to figure out how the damn thing works. Because in some sense, electromagnetism, any action at a distance is, is magic. And yes, we understand the, the technology, but it still has a magical quality. And basically that roped me in, but I didn't realize it. And I continued to build all kinds of things, model airplanes, uh, different devices. But little did I know an engineer had been born. And it was years later in high school that I realized I was going to go into electrical engineering. But I was not ready to commit at that young age of six or seven years old. What did you want to be when you were a kid? My father wanted me to be a CPA because he was a grocer. He was a Polish immigrant, came over after World War I, managed to become a grocer. And the highest level professional he dealt with was a certified public accountant. And he wanted me to be that. So I went to the library one day, I pulled out a book on accounting. It's a big, heavy, ugly book. And I started reading it and I couldn't figure out the difference between debit and credit. And by the way, it's not a trivial notion. I said, this is not for me. <laughs> So that was not a path I followed. But okay. I didn't want to commit to any particular uh, profession. Um, I got into Bronx High School of Science, uh, I passed the exam, and I was a little reluctant to go. It was a very difficult school. It was the best school in the country at the time. I was reluctant to go because that meant I'd be devoted to science. And I wasn't ready to commit even to that level of, of specialization. Uh, 
But I went, I took some sophisticated courses in radio engineering. And by then I realized, yep, electrical engineering is the way to go. It's full of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I was destined by then. You actually had to take night classes to get your bachelor's, correct? You bet. You bet. Working full time. Uh, And so you get your bachelor's, you take night school, uh, you decide to then go to MIT to pursue your doctorate, which is no easy path. So you really got dedicated to the field. It was a little more stepwise, actually. Okay. Um, I was set to go to city, and I couldn't afford to go to a a school that cost much. So I I decided to go to City College of New York. Wonderful school. It basically has graduated more Nobel laureates than any other public university in the country still. So I was set to go to day session. And then my father took me down to a cousin of his who had an electronic store in Manhattan. And the man offered me a job. And my father encouraged me to take it because the fact is we needed the income to support the family. CCNY charged $12 a semester, and I couldn't afford that. I had to bring money into the house. So I went to night session for five and a half years in electrical engineering. Now you think about it, who goes to night session? Crazies, dropouts, very dedicated, poor kids, and GIs who have come back from World War II. And who's teaching at night? Professors who were working in engineering during the day. And who am I working with in my daytime job as an engineer, as an assistant engineer? Again, graduate engineers, technicians, designers. So I had an enormously rich undergraduate career. My professors were smart and they knew what was going on. I remember one day the professor came in at night and he held in his hand a little thing. He said, see this, this is a transistor. It's a better thermometer than it is an amplifier. They had just come out and he was pointing out they were very sensitive to heat. And so their characteristics would be unreliable. And then he showed us how to fix that. He showed there was a a workaround to fix that. Now you would never get that kind of experience and, and knowledge from a daytime professor. They say, here's the way a a transistor works and that's it. So the richness and the practicality and the theory, the strong theory, the strong practice, putting it into practice during the day was an enormously valuable, very tough five and a half years. But it, it, it really helped shape the way I approach problems today. It sounds like it. And it, it's interesting because you wouldn't you wouldn't think of all that as an environment that would be so conducive to making you uh, such a successful learner. Right. Uh, I, like all those all those small things that I mean, usually that's not like the ideal environment. Right. No, and it, 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 it shapes you to kind of think differently, which has been the. <laughs> which we're all very thankful for <laughs> at this well, point. Okay, so you received your doctorate in electrical engineering at MIT. So let's describe what, at that time, what the tech scene was. Tech scene was interesting. Computers were quite the rage. They were used for scientific purposes, a little bit for business. They were being developed. They were large. They were roomfuls of equipment. And uh, there was a lot of work at MIT, a very glorious place on speech processing, on graphics. They even had started to do some time-sharing work. But what was clear is that those computers that I was part of at Lincoln Lab, MIT Lincoln Lab, and at MIT itself, they were wonderful machines, but they couldn't communicate. There was no way they could talk to each other. And in fact, my scholarship was through MIT Lincoln Lab. And at Lincoln Lab, they had built one of the first transistorized computers was called TX0. And then they shipped that down to MIT. And then they built a second one called TX2, where I spent a lot of my time doing my research. And those two machines were basically younger brother and older brother, but they couldn't communicate. And the folks at MIT wanted to use the TX2 and vice versa. And there was no way they could do it. I said, look, look, here's a problem. Sooner or later, machines will have to talk to each other. And there's but no- why did you why did you think that? Like, why did you say like, because w- everyone was working with these computers at that time? What made you say, "Hey, 
at some point, these two machines need to communicate. Well, the thing that actually triggered my thinking, as I said, there was a TX0 at MIT, TX2 at Lincoln Lab, and they were capable of talking the same language, but there was no communications network that would allow them to do that. So I said, look, let's create a network. Let's talk about a network where any computer can talk to any other computer and exchange information and share their resources. And you could log on to another machine across the country and use it because it may have some specialized resources. There may be a great graphics machine across the country and basically a high performance computing at Illinois. Why can't I use those machines instead of having to import all of those resources in one location? So the idea to me became fairly clear. And as I said, I wanted to work for the best professor I could find at MIT, and his name was Claude Shannon. All of his graduate students were working on extensions of his theory, information theory. And I felt that that's not what I wanted to be doing because those problems that were left over were really hard and had very small impact. Whereas putting computers together, it was a new problem. Nobody was looking at it. It would have impact. And I had an approach to solving that problem. That was exactly what I signed up for. Do you have any idea at the time what kind of incredible impact it would make? No, not at that time at all. It was a good engineering problem, challenging, good theory, good application, good simulation to do. So the answer is no. What advice would you give to other engineering students like at that time as you look back in that time frame of you thinking outside the box at this and going at it a different approach and saying, hey, I see potential here that others aren't seeing. And you probably got pushback for that as well. Think about the work you're doing and ask yourself the following question. Will it be remembered a thousand years from now? I mean, I'll ask you, what do you remember from a thousand years ago in the scientific or engineering or industrial world, very few things. How about 100 years? How about 10 years? But don't work on something which is gonna have a, a, a two week impact. So think big, think out of the box. And reach out of your comfort zone. Don't just do things that you know you can surely do, but reach out beyond your grasp, because that's where the gold is. It's hard, but that's where you have an opportunity to, to contribute, don't cut corners. Because you may have to show that what you did was, was in fact to the public and, and, and important. And by the way, failure is okay. Shoot so far that you may fail, you learn something from it. Don't be constrained by having to get success at every step of the way. And keep your curiosity up. And if something looks strange, don't say that's an anomaly because there's something interesting going on there. Pursue it, dig, find out what is strange about it. You're not only a gambler in your professional field, you're also a gambler in real life. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about your luck around the blackjack table. And you've had a, more than a couple trips to Vegas, right? Yes. Well, some years ago, Larry Roberts and I, one of the other fathers of the internet, put together a blackjack counting system long before it was popular. And so we were able to go to Las Vegas, play blackjack, and make some nice winnings. We didn't have a lot of money to, to invest, so our winnings were not in hundreds of thousands, but they were in the hundreds and the thousands. An interesting story, uh, one of the books I published won a prize in 1976. And the cover of the book is an, a Maurice Escher lithograph. It's called Ascending and Descending. It's a very wonderful, complicated uh, image that can't you, you can't build it in real life. Maurice Escher, wonderful thing. And I wanted to get a one of the 135 lithographs that he had signed. So on the way back from winning $1,000 for the book prize, I stopped in Las Vegas, turned into $2,300, came home, and one of my friends who was an art dealer said, Len, I understand there is one of those Escher lithographs going up for sale at Sotheby's. Can I bid for that? Sure you can. He said, how much can I bid? He says, well, what's it worth? He said, well, it's worth between $5,000 and $9,000, depending upon the condition. So I said, you can bid $4,500 for two reasons. Reason one, it's below market. 
Reason two, one more trip to Las Vegas, and I'll turn the 2300 into 4500 He bought the damn thing for $2,600. So the book okay. bought its own cover, and it's hanging in my living room right now. Oh, that's but, a great conversation piece, I bet. <laughs> oh, it is. But the blackjack was terrific. I mean, uh, Larry and I studied a number of things. And one day I got a call from out of the blue from a guy named Alan. And he wanted to talk to me about blackjack and roulette. And he met me here in my home in, in LA. And in talking to him, I realized he had been a, a, a dealer up in Lake Tahoe the previous summer. And he also had a counting system. And he was able not only to count the usual way, but he could remember how many threes and fours were left in the deck, which is a big advantage, as you'll see. Wow. So I said, look, Alan, and he, he told me his story. Um, I said, let's let's go to Las Vegas and we'll gamble there together in Blackjack. Oh, man. You, so we went. Brave soul. <laughs> <laughs> we were downtown. He and I and a dealer. So it was a nice small game. And it was an open deck. So all the cards are shown, except for the dealer's holder. And they dealt Alan. It was near the end of the deck. They dealt Alan a 10 and a 7. And, of course, he never drew a 10 and 7. So Alan said, hit me. Dealer said, you don't want to get hit. Alan said, hit me. Dealer said, no, you don't want to hit 17. Alan said, God damn it, give me the four. He knew exactly what was left in the deck. He got the four. He won. They changed dealers. They put in a mechanic. And the next 15 minutes, we started going downhill big time because the guy was a crook. Anyway, but these are the kinds of things. That's not when two men in big black jackets came and escorted you out of the building? <laughs> that was a different that's time. That was, okay. <laughs> that was a different time. Larry and I were trying roulette. You know, a roulette ball will fall off the wheel at a Newtonian predictable time. There's a speed of the ball, a speed of the wheel. It'll fall off. You can calculate it. And if you can fi figure out which half of the wheel it's going to fall on, You've got two to one odds. But we had to measure the speed of the ball. So Larry and I went to Las Vegas. He took a microphone, put it in his palm, wrapped his arm up like he had a broken arm, put a tape recorder in his jacket, and rested his hand next to the roulette wheel so we could hear the ball going around and see the speed and decide at what speed it'll fall off the wheel. So where they're gathering data, I went down there with him, and I'm the decoy. So I'm playing roulette and Larry sort of got his hand next to the wheel. And damn it, I started winning. <laughs> and it drew enormous attention to me. So I'm winning. I'm Larry's friend. Larry's hand is next to the wheel. So the pit boss says, let me see your broken arm. And he takes Larry's arm and he yanks it. And Larry and I look at each other. And we could almost see those guys in the big black jackets. Can we hightail it the hell out of here? With all that we know about you, uh, let's go back to that historical moment when the that first message that first message was transmitted. Of course, we had it at UCLA a very excellent group of researchers in networking students that I had been teaching and, and graduating uh, because I brought the theory that I developed at MIT with me to UCLA, and so ARPA decided to fund this ARPA net. And the first node was created at UCLA in September 1969. In October 1969, the second node, the second switch, uh, by the way, the switch is that thing behind my shoulder, that gray box. That gray box is the first router ever on the internet. And it's in the same location where it served them. And that's the event you're talking about. The second one of those was placed up at Stanford Research Institute 350 miles to the north. And a high-speed line was connected between the two. So now we were ready to test a two-node network. Now, what was this network supposed to do? I gave you a hint before. It was such that if I'm sitting at one computer and I want to use the services of another computer, I should be able to log on from my computer through this network onto their computer and use the services there. Well, today that's commonplace. You're constantly going to, 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 to web servers all over the place. In those days, it was remarkable. So we wanted to test this process. Sit at one computer. There's another one 350 miles to the north through a network. Log into it. So we decided 
that we wanted to log in from UCLA to SRI. And if I may, I'd like to share my screen and show you what the setup was. So what I'd like to show you is what happened that day when we tried to log in from UCLA to SRI. There was no camera, no tape recorder. The only record we have of what happened that day was in this log that we kept. And the most important entry in that log is right here. It was put in in October 29th, 1969 at 10.30 at night. And this is the only record of the first message ever on the internet. It says, we talked to SRI host to host. And the entry is made by my programmer who actually typed it in, Charlie Klein. And so the setup was this. A machine at UCLA through this green switch that imp I showed you behind my back through a high-speed line to the SRI switch to the SRI computer. We want to log in from one computer to another. So the first question is, what was that first message ever? Well, was it really something great like a giant leap for mankind? Was it, come here, Watson, I need you? Or what hath God wrought for the telegraph? Nope. All we wanted to do was log in, as I said. And to log in, you have to type L-O-G. And the remote machine is smart enough to know what you're doing. It'll type the IN for you. And the setup was here. And just to be sure we knew what was going on, we had Charlie Klein down at my end and Bill Duval up at the SRI end connected by a telephone. I mean, this packet switching stuff, what is it? How do we know it's working? On the telephone, we'll be able to see what's happening, talk about what's happening. Now understand the irony here, Elizabeth. We're using the telephone network to prove a new technology, which is going to eat the lunch of the telephone network. And eventually it did, but there we are. So Charlie said to the end, he sent the L, he said, you get the L? Bill said, yep, got the L. We sent the O, did you get the O? Yep, got the O. We sent the G, you get the G? Crash, system went down. The first message ever on the internet was low. As in, lo and behold, magic. Well, there you now, go. I added the and behold later, <laughs> but lo I is like the very it. first message. Lo so, and behold, beautiful. And, you know, you might wonder, uh, what was it that crashed? Well, it wasn't UCLA's computer. It wasn't our switch. It wasn't the high-speed line. It wasn't the SRI switch. It was the SRI host, so it was their fault. Now, what happened was there were buffer overflow, and it caused it to crash. The first of many technical problems that happen in the future. <laughs> yes, but it was a non-event, Elizabeth. This was not a big event. We didn't go home and say, boy, we created something significant. Wait, wait, wait. So this, the, the first message, the, the reason that we can email today was not a big event. Yeah, by the way, that was not email. That was just a message. Email came a couple of years later. But that was what was the underpinnings. The un exactly. Right. And the reason we can send the emails we do today is because of that experiment that worked. That's incredible. So, okay, so this event happens. It's not that, it's, it's a, it's a non-event, as you describe. You guys all go home. And then what was the reaction? When did, when did it become an event? Very, very slowly. Because even though we had two computers now, none of the, and then we started adding more nodes and more computers, none of the people who were joining the network really wanted to join. They were highly reluctant. Why? You go to some guy, say, at Carnegie Mellon. He has a big computer serving his students and his faculty there. And OPA, the organization that funded this development, goes to Carnegie Mellon and says, we want you to put your computer on this ARPANET, this network, which eventually became the internet. Why? Well, we want you to be able to share your resources. And the guy said, are you kidding? My machine at Carnegie Mellon is being used 100% of the time for my students and faculty. You can't have it. Well, ARPA twisted the arm and made them put it on. So nobody was anxious to begin to use this network, for, at least for that reason. The second reason is it was very difficult. In order to use a remote machine, you've got to get a login, a password. You've got to understand the command language, the applications, the software. It's a big headache. 
it's much easier to use your own machine with which you, with which you're familiar. So there's a lot of reluctance in answer to your question. This thing didn't suddenly spark. By 1971, some of the folks on my team, and by the, the software team I had, was a terrific team of people. We had people like Vince Cerf, Steve Cracker, Charlie Klein, Mike Wingfield, John Postel, names that some of your technical people will recognize, um, putting things together. And by 1971, that team had put together a protocol, a host-host protocol, by which you could easily log on and use remote machines. And even then it was very slow use. How did you conceptualize this to people? Like, did you tell your, were you able to like tell your wife what was happening? Were you able to like discuss this with people that weren't in the industry very well? I mean, was there any like way that re- reference points that people really understood what you were doing? Well, you talk about my wife. I had a remote terminal at home. And I, in fact, I could communicate with my machine at UCLA and then over the net to other machines. So she could see what I was doing, a kind of nerdy thing. What's that all about? This click, 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 clack, this thermal printer going on. But, you know, we could talk to industry. Now, who was the largest network company in the world at the time? It was AT&T. And we told AT&T, look, when I got out of MIT, I developed this great theory as to how these data networks should work. Went to AT&T and said, look, you ought to build a data network. And they said, it's not going to work. And even if it does work, we want nothing to do with it. And they said, little boy, go away. You said that they didn't want anything to do with it? Absolutely. That's incredible. Why? Well, that's a great question. Why? And I thought about it, and I realized they had a good reason. There was no business model. Nobody was sending data. There was no revenue model here. So they were short-term correct and postponing long-term big mistake. But uh, it, but what happened is since they pushed myself and other people like me away, we had to develop our own technology, hence the ARPANET, hence eventually the internet, which of course dominated the technology world. But it was difficult to communicate what was going on. I mean, why would you want computers to talk with each other anyway? Uh, you know, I had a vision at the time of what this would become. Where did that vision come from? My vision? Well, it was a few things. At the time, we put out a press release to UCLA in which I was quoted as to how this network would be used and uh, what it would become. And in fact, let me share my screen once again. I'll show you the press release release itself. There was a press release put out in July of 1969, months before the first switch arrived at UCLA. And on the second page of that press release, in in the press release, I'm describing how machines could be used remotely as I described before. But at the bottom there, I have a vision as to what this network would become. That was basically the vision I had. And what I said was the following. I said, as of now, computer networks are still in their infancy, but as they grow up and become more sophisticated, we will probably see the spread of computer utilities. Well, we call those things web-based IP services today. While like present electric and telephone utilities, well, that means it's an always on invisible technology, which will service individual homes and offices across the country. It's gonna be everywhere. Anybody with any device can get on. That was my vision and it was a very accurate vision. In fact, there's two parts to it. One part has not yet happened. That's the invisibility. We don't have an invisible internet now. And secondly, I totally missed the entire social network side, that which dominates the use of the internet today. But there was this vision that I had at the time, and I could see where things were going to be going. You ask, where did I get that vision from? Well, in working with the, with the, with the theory and the architecture, I saw that this would be a sensible way for things to move ahead. Now, there was another visionary, by the way, You know, there was someone some years ago, and I'm going to paraphrase his quote. He said things like, it will be possible for a businessman in New York to communicate with his colleague in London instantly at almost no cost using a device no larger than a watch. And we'll be able to send any form of picture, diagram, 
text speech as easily as anything. Now, you recognize whatever that person was talking about, it sounds like it was the internet. When was that said? 1908 by Nikola Tesla. Oh my gosh. So my point is, this idea was in the air. This vision had to wait for the technology to catch up to it. And it happened just around the time we described in 1969, when the technology would allow high-speed processing to accurately and effectively switch the capacity of the communications network and send packets and messages around efficiently. So the idea, this was in the air. It was going to happen, Elizabeth. You just caught it. Yeah, I happened to be there at the right time. You so, know, there's a, there's a comment uh, to follow what you said. I just happened to be there. If none of us were there, neither me, nor Vin, nor Larry Roberts, nor Bob Kahn, nor, nor uh, uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, if none of us were there, this still would have happened. It was destined to happen. It was in the air. It, was going to, it may not have happened exactly that time or exactly the way we see it, but it was going to happen. It was, it was basically ready to happen. You said you didn't expect the social networking side of this. Uh, What are your thoughts about that now? Well, I never realized that my my mother, my 99-year-old mother, would be on the internet at the same time as my granddaughter was. And they were. I totally missed the fact that it's about people communicating with each other. And by the way, the first time I recognized that was in 1972, when email first came onto the internet. And it suddenly captured the traffic of the internet. 75% of internet traffic was email. People talking to each other, exchanging ideas and information. And some of these news groups coming up, people who like photography or cooking or science fiction would get together and communicate. What do I think about it? Well, there's been an interesting trajectory with the social networking world. It was there among engineers and nerds up until the mid nineties, when suddenly the internet launched itself into the world of consumers. And that's a whole other story you could talk about later if you like. But then it reached out to consumers all over the world. And then the social networks that we see today, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Snapchats and all the rest, uh, they have dominated our society now. They've dominated thought. And unfortunately, the thing which gives the internet its power and I'll describe that, what gives the internet power is anybody with a computer sitting in their basement, they can be banana peels all over the floor, poor, with a computer and internet access, can reach out to anybody across the world, to millions of people instantly, at no cost in effort or money, anonymously. Well, that also enables the dark side of the internet. Easy, cheap access, anonymous if you want, can cause all kinds of bad things to bubble up, and they have. You've seen them. We all live that world now. And so the internet has a deep, dark side, and it's very difficult to control. The benefits are enormous, of course. We have some wonders that have come out of the internet. We could spend a lot of time talking about that. But the dark side is is the thing that's basically gripped us now. It's not just nuisance. It's not just hackers annoying us. It's people shaming us. It's people stealing from us. And it's nation states that are committing crimes. Nation states that are putting boundaries around their network and killing the open network into a set of splintered or if we'll balkanize networks. And the social network allowing the misinformation to propagate so easily is part of that unfortunate formula. Do you have any predictions for us 20 years down the road, if we keep at the same pace, you know, we always, I kind of feel like throughout history we have pendulums, right? And when we veer too, too far into something, it moderates itself out. And in this social media world where we're being, we're kind of, we're in a good height of it, (laughs) I feel, or maybe, maybe 
we're even going to get more, but I feel like people are kind of pulling back from Facebook. I see this, this societal change of like this, this stomach churning of the social media world. And so do you have any like predictions on that of you? Do you think that we're going to go even farther into this social media communication, or do you think we'll pull back from the internet and start um, evaluating and being more ethical by ourselves? I'm glad you used the pronoun we. Okay. That's part of the key. Okay. You know, right now, a lot of the difficult part of the internet to come and the privacy issues have come because this we, the public, the stakeholders, are not expressing our concerns. And the only way out of the morass we're finding ourselves in today is to get all the stakeholders to participate. Government to give us the forum by which we can communicate industry, the scientific community, and the user population. I mean, how? when's the last time you told Facebook what privacy policy you would like applied to you? They don't ask. And until we express ourselves and say, look, here's what I'm willing to accept. And if you're giving me that, I won't take it. We have to modify and negotiate and make it right. Until we get to talk about it collectively, we're not going to get anywhere. So it's a it's a joint effort. That's part of the solution. And it's a very difficult one. I mean, we are dealing with nation stage, states which have, which have their own agenda. We're dealing with big tech industry, which have their own agenda. And we need to moderate some of that. So but how, how do we, we, the people, have <laughs> yeah, it is we communicate? <laughs> well, we have an internet to communicate with. Okay. Yes, yes. And how do we get the platform? <laughs> it is the platform. And I, 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 I'm optimistic about it, but it's not going to be easy. But what I foresee in the future on the positive side is that we will finally achieve that one element of my vision that's not yet been achieved, namely that the internet will become invisible. It will disappear into the infrastructure. Wherever you go, you'll have internet and you'll be able to communicate it the way you and I are now, by voice, by gestures, by haptics, by facial gestures, et cetera. And uh, I'll be able to walk into a room and the room should know I'm there. Should know it's me. It should know my preferences, my priorities, my privileges, and should be able to present what I want, what I need. There'll be software agents in the internet, which will provide me services matched and customized to me. In fact, if you want to characterize what the future will hold, I like to discuss it as we will have basically a pervasive global nervous system. We call that the internet now. It'll be something else. It'll be everywhere and it'll be customized to your no needs. I think I, I've heard about this in the, uh, the, uh, like the facilitator, the people that um, travel and travel, this is kind of catching on where they're making customized experiences. Mm -hmm. It will be. And it'll, it'll be that way all along. When I touch your computer, it'll be matched to my needs. Do you think that'll be a good thing? Do you think that, I mean, isn't that kind of an invasion of privacy? I, I, do you think that'll be good that a computer knows like what I so much about me? Well, you should be able to articulate what policy of, of privacy you're willing to accept. And the system should, in fact, agree to that or tell you if it's not, and then you can back off from it. But you, should, you, you, you need to express what you're saying. And by the way, you asked, um, will the social network people correct themselves? You know, the younger generation today, they consider they they're much more lax about their privacy they're much more communicative and i think the the as the generations come along the modes will change and they will modify the technology that they use that they're willing to use to adapt to their own desires and and mores and 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 uh, desires so i i think there's hope but we're in a very difficult time right now because uh, there are movements right now, as I say, for splintering the network into private nation state networks, corporate networks, uh, tribal networks, if you will. And if we close boundaries around pieces of the network, we lose the wonderful open network we have today. And that's the source of its great power. How do we, because so, I've, I've heard this from uh, multiple interviewees of this, this, this need, the treasure of open source internet. Uh, how do we create an environment for this to be in better, better hands? That's a really hard one. 
And I know that's a really hard question that doesn't really have a, a strong answer, but I just wanted to hear your thoughts. Well, part of it has to do with the gratification one gets in using the network. Part of it is to share ideas and, and, and products and services. You know, in those early days of the internet, we had no concept of intellectual property, patenting, ownership. Everything we did was open and shared and free and ethical. And uh, those are the words we used. We don't use those words anymore, by the way, so much. And the gratification we got was to produce something, a piece of software, a piece of hardware, a, a program that others would use. And that was the gratification we got. We don't have any patents from those days, happily. So it's all, op- it's all available. Now, that's not the case today. Once, we re- once the world recognized that the consumer was a marketplace, a shopping mall, if you will, a, 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 a social network, a, a, a gossip chamber, and the profit motive came into the picture that totally shifted where the internet went. That happened in the early 90s. The first spam message, broad-based spam message, was on April 12th, 1994. And it was a couple of lawyers advertising their services to help some people get green cards. When that came out, by the way, it, it was broad blast across the internet. We saw that and we said, we sent email back to them, said, how dare you? You can't advertise on our network, on our scientific experiment here. Shame on you, stop, cease and desist. We sent so much email back to them we took down their server. So as an unintended consequence of the first spam, the broad-based spam, we created the first denial of service attack. But it was too late. It was too late. The the world of business recognized this is a way to reach the consumer. And we took a serious left turn, we, the internet. And we've been suffering from that for a long time. I'd like to get it corrected if we can, but it's not going to be easy. Is there anything that you would have done differently collectively with the other engineers during that time, looking back? Well, there are a couple of things we could have done and we chose not to. One thing we should have done was put on strong file authentication, which means when I send you a document or a file, you and I can prove that what I sent you is what you received. It wasn't replaced, it wasn't modified, et cetera. Second thing we should have done was put in strong user authentication so that I know what I'm, that I'm talking to Elizabeth right now. I see your face, but it could be, you know, a deep fake. You know, there should be a way to authenticate users. And that would not have been difficult to do in those early days. And had we done that, the first thing we should have done was turn it off because we didn't need it. Everybody was paying good netiquette. We were all being honest, fair, not mischievous sharing our work. And as the need began to arose, we could have turned it on slowly to try to slow down the, the rapid growth of the dark side. That would not have prevented what we have today. It would have helped to ameliorate it to some extent. It's very difficult to do that now because we have 50 years of legacy of equipment, of software, of products out there that would have to be changed, and it's very difficult. So that's one of the things we, we, we could have done differently. Um, in terms of the openness, we should have done a lot more to foster that sense of openness and sharing instead of let it just follow its path to become a tool of the, uh, of the profit-making world. Are any of these things that, uh, are, can we do them now? As I said, the only approach to getting that done is through this multi-stakeholder discussion and engagement. We have to speak up. Scientists have to come up with solutions. And we have a number of interesting solutions that can help. You know, there's, there's all kinds of cryptography. There's all kinds of what's called homomorphic encryption. There's all kinds of capabilities where we can do, we can keep secrets, share information, and yet keep individual secrets. The technology is beginning to come out. Um, and it, it will. So the scientists are doing their job. The industry has to be willing to soften some of their grip on, the, on all of the, the, uh, the, the platforms and the technology. The government has to step into and offer appropriate regulation, not too much, not too little. The whole issue of regulation is the Goldilocks problem. You know, it's gotta be just right. And then the user, the user who's been very quiet, as I said, has to step in 
and express themselves. Um, you know, back then, when we when all of this wonderful things happened in those early days of the opera and everything, there was a, a culture which is not often recognized. And it came out of opera, the agency that in fact provided the funding for the, um, the OPANET. They had a wonderful way of funding. They would go to a professor and say, look, we know you're great in your field. Here's a pile of money. You're gonna have it for a long time. Go do something challenging and great. Reach high. Don't worry about failure, keep going. And what did the professor do with that money? Well, their salary was being paid by the university. They used that money to support graduate students. And what does the professor say? Same thing to the graduates. Look, here's some hard problems. Go solve it. Take a leap. Try something bold. Failure's okay. And so that culture of sharing openness, failure's okay, but boldness was present in those early days. And out of that era came some wonderful results. Networking, graphics, chip technology, artificial intelligence, on and on and on. We don't have that same philosophy today, unfortunately. And it's some of that openness I'd like to bring back to the world we live in. And in, in an attempt to do that, I've opened up just recently something called the UCLA Connection Lab. And it's, it provides an environment for creative, interdisciplinary research among graduate students, faculty, undergraduate students, visiting scholars, to try to bring us back to that network that we had in those days, that thinking, that philosophy of openness and sharing and cross-disciplinary thinking. Let's talk more about that Connection Lab. What are you currently working on? Oh, working on a variety of wonderful things. Working on, of course, network. By the way, it's called the UCLA Connection Lab, and the underlying theme is connectivity just as you might expect. Well, everything is connectivity. So we're working on things like internet of things, connected devices in our walls and our fingertips, working on networking itself, working on wireless, working on cryptography, working on blockchain, working on uh, graphics, a variety of things, all of which involve connectivity. And some breakthroughs are coming through. And we're beginning to represent uh, our results out into the world through some very excellent uh, presentations and uh, um, lectures that we're going to be giving. So what's next? What's next? <sighs> what's next is to solve some of the problems we have in today's world. For example, using the internet for the way it could be and should be used, which means bringing education across the world in an accessible way. And in fact, this pandemic has helped foster that we're, we're doing a lot more remote virtual teaching than we did before. We wanna make it available. And that means we have to provide the technology, the devices, the information and the environment, which means we have to feed people, we have to clothe them, we have to house them, we have to give them technology so they can learn. And I believe that that challenge is the societal challenge of today. And the internet is there I think to provide a good piece of that solution, there's far more pieces we have to put together. But the ability to let people grow to the level of their ability, to give them the education, the information, the interaction, the hands-on, I think is, is critical. And I love that, I grow to the, the level of their ability. Yep. Very wise words. You recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the internet on October 29th, 2019 at UCLA with many heavy hitters in the tech community. Tell me a little bit more about that. We had some really great people to discuss the difficult side of the internet. We had Eric Schmidt, we had Mark Cuban, we had Peter Thiel, Ashton Kutcher, Vince Cerf, Werner Herzog, Jamie Dimon, Gary Kasparov, Bob Metcalf, myself, the mayor, the chancellor of UCLA. We have Patrice Cullors. We have people from society, from the underprivileged areas. We had the original um, uh, creators of the internet there. Uh, we had some wonderful discussions. Uh, we addressed hard issues. We addressed privacy. We addressed winner take all. We addressed the underprivileged. We addressed the uh, things about pornography. 
we addressed um, the 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 access to education across the world. We talked about creating a society that accepts the internet, the benefits of the internet, rather than the dark side. And it was a really wonderful meeting. It, it, it's available on the net, by the way. If you look up Internet 50 UCLA. And I pointed out that we shouldn't be shackled by the constraints of today, but we should be driven by the possibilities of tomorrow. And I think that's a very good theme to think about. That that's in general a wonderful way to to view life and challenge. What have these experiences taught about you about yourself? <laughs> They've taught me that having chosen to be a professor was the smartest thing I could have done. I hadn't planned to be a professor. I sort of fell into it by accident. It allows me to do research in any field I want that interests me. I have no boss not having a boss, to doing exactly what I want to do in my research. The antidote to that, that I have to that, is that I studied martial arts. I've been studying martial arts for the last 40 years. And when I go, I'm, I'm a second degree black belt in Shotokan Karate. When I go to the dojo and sensei says bow, I bow. And he says punch, I punch. And that difference in the way my mind worked during that period is wonderful, it's cleansing. It's the antithesis of being my own boss, setting my own path. I have to follow orders, I have to do it right. And it's a kind of a yin-yang, refreshing view of, of, of living. Well, and I was going to talk to you about that because I'm going to disclose your age here, if that's okay. You sure. are 87 and you look amazing. <laughs> like, I got to tell you, you look great. And so a lot of that, do you, do you uh, uh, give credit to... Martial arts? A lot of that. A lot to DNA, of course. My, 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 my gene pool, hopefully. My mother lived to be 99. My father lived to be 94. But the, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with your view of life. If you enjoy what you're doing and you keep at it and you keep challenging yourself instead of lying back and relaxing and opening up new areas, don't stay in one spot in your professional life for too long, shift, move as, as, as things mature, move into new fresh areas, uh, open up new challenges, constantly challenge yourself. And uh, that keeps me alive every day, anxious to get to work, anxious to dig in, to do the same thing I did as a kid, puzzles, comic books, sports, games. It's the same life. I love it. That's that's great advice and so wonderful to hear from a man like you. Uh, do you credit you, 40 years in martial arts? I mean, that's amazing. Do you cr credit that? To, and that's kind of a outlier uh, passion of a typical engineer. Do you, uh, do you credit that to any of you, the way that you like longevity in your career, work-life balance, anything like that? Well, you know, I actually studied Latin in high school. And there's a wonderful quote in Latin, which in English says, a sound mind in a sound body. And I believe there's enormous wisdom in that. And so I've tried to live up to that credo, if you will. You know, I've always enjoyed sports. Uh, I, I entered karate when I was basically 48 years old. Um, you know, I, I did marathoning. I, I was on the swim team. I did a lot of... Uh, other sports, bicycling, uh, you have to mix the two. You have to refresh yourself every day uh, and uh, recharge with some good physical activity and good, some good mental activity. And you have to have a wonderful lot wife like I do who feeds me the best food you can imagine, keeps me healthy. And keeps me. That's the happy. real secret to your success. You, you got it. <laughs> You're that you all it. single men. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love all of that. I uh, I absolutely agree. A healthy um, body is a healthy mind. Uh, I want to touch on the pandemic because we are so close to it, and this is such an important time in history. Uh, what do you think we can learn about our relationship with the internet from the pandemic? Well. Putting the internet aside for a moment, we learned a really bad lesson. 
is the following. Science fiction writers and the um, humanity in general has always felt we, you know, nations fight each other, they disagree, tribes disagree, but we always felt if there was an external threat, humanity on this planet would get together and fight it as a consistent group. Well, we had such an alien threat, it's called a pandemic, and we didn't get together. There are factions, there are jealousies, there, there are, um, there's greed, which is not allowing us to move ahead as we should. So sad to say, we didn't pass that test. Um, that's one thing the pandemic taught us. Another thing it taught us is that we are now able, as a result of this pandemic, to have conducted experiments we never could have conducted. The experiments have to do with, you know, work at home, remote teaching, medicine, entertainment, exchange. And so we conducted these magnificent worldwide experiments. And I know there are people who have studied the results and the data. I know we have collected the data from those experiments very effectively. These experiments we never could have conducted. And I'm very anxious to see what we're gonna find out from the data as it comes in. We found that yes, remote work is okay to a limit, but it's not an anathema. It can provide some, some goodness. Remote teaching, yes, we're learning. It's not as good as in person, but it has its benefits. You can record the absolutely best faculty and teachers in the world and send that out to the Himalayas. So anybody up there in Tibet can, can, can get the same benefit. Um, entertainment, a lot of us are going through Netflix as opposed to the theaters these days. Is that good? Hard to say, but it's a change. But in terms of the... Uh, Ability to come together, the opening statement I made, I'm very sad to say that we couldn't agree on a proper protocol to deal with the pandemic in a global and effective way. Now, in terms of the internet, it's shown that the internet works. It's provided the link to all of those experiments we've run, the entertainment, the education, the work, the uh, medicine. And it's, it's, it's managed to stand up in the midst of a really difficult attack. You know, we needed that internet to take on a lot more traffic, reach a lot more places beyond continuously. And it did succeed. And I'm very proud that it was there at just the right time to ameliorate a lot of the difficulty that this pandemic has caused. So hats off to you, internet. I don't think we've missed anything that uh, is worthwhile in a discussion like this, except to say how much I've enjoyed chatting with you, Elizabeth. It's, it's been a pleasure. Oh, the pleasure is all mine.